Hi everyone. Um, sorry, it was so silent there for like thirteen seconds. I just w wanted to check if it was actually going, but it is, and everything's okay. So I I hope everyone is well today. Um, this sermon is called. Um, the grace to grow. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're about to do. Lord Jesus, speak to me, speak through me. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, I was watching a YouTube video with Ian Tongi. As I said a few weeks ago, if you go for you, um, a, video, a few videos back, I love E.M. Tongi, not only his music, but his personality. And I was watching um, the, the some interviews with him, with him, and um, he did an interview with uh, Sp Spidey, who is, he's a producer. He's a photographer. Uh, he takes the most beautiful pictures ever. And he also has a, he works with artists and musicians to take pictures and photos. He's a photographer. Um, takes the most beautiful pictures ever. So he has a podcast. And he was sitting down with Ian. And um, uh, he asked him who he would like to work with. And one of the people that he said, he said to, first he said Chris Stapleton. And then he said Morgan Wallen, which, which everybody knows who Chris Stapleton is. He did... Tennessee whiskey and all the other other hits and Morgan Wallen, uh, he's does a song called "Cover Me Up" and a couple other songs. He's really big in a really short time in the country music industry. And the first time I heard of Morgan Wallen, he um. It was through Ian Tongi. Ian Tongi did a cover of uh, his song, Sand in My Boots. And the Sand in My Boots is a wonderful song. And he and he's also sang inform, informally, Cover Me Up. So, uh, so in the, in the interview that I was watching, Ian said that that video made me cry. So after I was fi finished watching the Ian Tongi video, um, I was so intrigued that I thought, what video would make Ian Tongi cry? So I looked up the video on YouTube, and my God, it made me cry. The video for Cover Me Up, if anyone wants to see this video, watch it. It is powerful. Oh, God. I thought the song was good, but the video is just so moving, soul-stirring, everything. Oh, so, um, while I was watching the video, something else about Morgan Wallen uh, came up. Um, you know how when you're watching YouTube, other videos, a combo of videos you've watched before, a combo of people that you've watched before, and the combo of the person that you're watching come up? So something about Morgan Wallen came up 
having to do with the uh, Today Show. Uh, no, Good Morning America. So I clicked on it. And um, I saw where in a few years ago, he was caught on video saying the N-word. Um, and there was this whole backlash thing. And um, not to say what he did was right. It wasn't by any means. By any means. As a Black person, it is very offensive to me that people use that word. But at the same time, I was thinking, cancel culture is so pervasive that we don't even give people room to grow. We, uh, granted, after the incident happened, that he was caught on camera using the N-word, um, he reached out to a whole bunch of black organizations and all that. And I was thinking to myself, we don't even give people the room to grow, the room to figure stuff out. Maybe he grew up in the South and just that's how they talked because it's systemic in its history. And I'm not saying it's right, but we need to give people room to learn and, and grow and give people the grace to go to grow, not excuse their behavior, but educate them instead of canceling them. I love what the interviewer, because the interviewer, um, uh, I forget his name. Uh, he's an African American gentleman. Um, instead of getting mad and all huffy. He just educated him on the word and the history of the word and what the word does um, to, um, to Black people. And um, he began to work with organize, um, Morgan Wallen began to work with organizations um, to, you know, to educate himself on black people and whatever, and as the case may be. And I was thinking, my God, we don't, we don't give people room to grow. We don't have to excuse them. We have to educate them because education is the key. So, because maybe where he grew up, that was common, and he never got to know any any black person and whatever. He probably knew that it was the best thing to do, but you know, um, sometimes you just uh, say things flippantly, like you say things to your friends that are not like right, and you're just flipping about things and you don't know. But my my thing is we need to give people the grace to grow and stop putting them on blast for every little mistake that they make and educate them instead of canceling them. Because cancel culture, all it does is shut you away from the society, whereas education hopefully will cause you to learn and grow and all that stuff. So, and I was also watching Jelly Roll, uh, who is, um, oh, he's a lovely man. Um, I'd love to work with Meat Jelly Roll. Uh, he's a, a uh, country singer. Country singer slash rock singer has 
Um, he has several number ones, and he he has his number ones called Son Son of a Sinner. He has uh, I Need a Favor. He's just awesome. And if anybody knows J- Jelly Roll story, he um he made um he got charged with I think it was um he got charged with something when he was like fifteen and he he was in and out of the out of the justice uh justice system for years. Until he decided to change his life, and now he's going back to the same jail and restoring people. And as I saw Jelly Roll uh, talk about his story, all Jelly Roll is in his thirties now. No, Jelly Roll, Jelly Roll is thirty nine. Like the same, um. I think he's 39 or 40 now. He's like almost the same age as me. And this has been years uh, down the road. But he still has restrictions that he can't ever do. He Jelly Roll's American, so he can't, he cannot come to Canada. He can't vote in the American election. He can't do all that stuff. He can't uh, do all that stuff. It's like we punish people for mistakes instead of restoring people. We like to throw people to the wolves rather than restoring people and giving them a break. I'm not I'm not talking about excusing bad behavior. I'm talking about educating and restoring. I was thinking about the prison just uh and the justice system. And we are so um into um um uh, re, we're so into locking people up that we d- and the prison system should be uh, we lock people away and then while they're away they don't just sit there and waste away we educate them we get them help we restore them because the bible says when somebody's caught in a fall, the thing to do is restore one. And then when we restore them, they get back to society. It was like, make one mistake and you're put away for life. Or um, go to jail for anything. And when you come out, you can't get a job. You can't do this. And then there are beautiful organizations that help with this. But I'm here to say that we need to be focused on restoring the person rather just, rather just you make one mistake, you do something wrong once, we don't want anything to do with you. We throw you away. That's not the Christ-like attitude that God wants us to have. We don't excuse bad behavior. We educate on bad behavior. We do what that reporter did for Morgan Wallen. We do what um, reportedly B.B. White Winans did for Morgan Wallen. We do what Jelly Roll is now doing for for the prisoners by telling his story and his testimony. Um, He's educating them. He's restoring them. He's saying, 
you may be locked up, but you're still human. You still have value. I was watching AJ McQueen, uh, which is AJ uh, Alex. I'll call him Alex because I'm not talking about his persona right now. Um, Alex from the Backstreet Boys. Um, and he was talking about uh, how we kind of um how people are just easy to like how he was like uh talking about his self and his story with drugs and the restorate the restorative process that he had to go through in his relationship with with his marriage and how his wife uh, stuck by him and all that stuff, and and they had a separation to figure some stuff out, and now they're back together. See, to restore somebody is not pretty. It takes work. It takes compassion. It's easy to lock people up and forget about them, but this, but the. But one thing that Jelly Roll said, he said, some of the most smartest people, the most talented people are locked away and forgotten about. And I think when somebody goes to jail, I think the ideally the first step would would be to find out what went wrong. I think everybody in jail should have a team of doctors, a team of therapists. It should be mandatory to find out what went wrong. And if they need medication, that should be provided for them. If they need uh, intensive therapy, that should be provided for them. That should, um, all our taxpayer dollars should go to this stuff, not just lock uh, people up and like just throw away the key and say, oh, they're in jail. They're a bad person. No, they're a broken person. And what we need to understand is we're all broken somewhere. We're all broken somewhere. I may not be in jail, but there are places where I'm broken that you can't see. There are places where you're broken that people can't see. And because people can see people's brokenness in jail, it doesn't mean that they don't have value. And, And just because just because their brokenness is exposed and you have brokenness, but it's under a church hat, doesn't mean their brokenness is more, is is worse than yours. We love to put people on blast that we don't know. Um, we love celebrity gossip. We're like, oh, that person cheating on so and so. Oh, that person is sleeping with a seventeen-year-old person. Oh, the, we we love it. It it tintillates our senses. But what I've what I've learned what the line that came to me the other day is um. Everybody is somebody's somebody. So when you're laughing at that celebrity, when you're watching all this celebrity gossip nonsense, when you're participating in that, that is somebody's daughter. That is somebody's wife. 
that is somebody's sister. How dare you do that? How dare you do that? And we love to just spread our mouths um, around to people we don't know. We love to do it with celebrities. We love to say, oh, that person is charged with so-and-so. Oh, that person got arrested for so-and-so. Because it's not us, but given a different situation, it couldn't be us. And you know what? The same stuff happens to every one of us. But the only thing is, when 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 you're when you're caught stepping out on your wife, no one knows about it. When you're caught with a a fist of Jack in your car, no one knows about it because you're not famous and you can hide. But fame shines a light. But we need to give people the grace to grow. We need to know that we are all human. We are all learning. We are all growing. We have different struggles. But the process, life is a process. And you will never get this life right. But what you what you can know is that you'll grow and you'll grow and you'll grow and you'll grow and God will be with you in your growing. God is with you in your growing. Don't beat yourself up. You're not falling. You didn't fail. You're just growing and growth takes time, and you will never grow to perfection, but you will grow to the man or woman God wants you to be. And I think we need to give people room for growth, and we we just, even as a society, even the penal system, we don't give people room to grow, whatever, we just say, you did this, well, we'll just throw you away. You can't, you're no good to society now. And that's what we say to people. Every time we put our job applications, have you been uh, incarcerated or whatever they put, like, um, uh, you know, we don't give people the room to grow and pay for the their mistakes and the ability to um, be, be productive citizens afterwards. I believe jails should be focused on getting the person better, healing the person, even, like, because people don't murder or commit crimes or rape or whatever for no reason. Sometimes it, it's mental illness. Sometimes it's something from their past. Sometimes they need medication. Sometimes they're dealing with anger issues. And sometimes they're innocent. But I think in the jail system, instead of locking people away, we should we should be um we should be taking them to to some place where they can recover where they can become worthwhile members of society like i think every um every convict should have a team of a doctor a therapist, they should have intensive uh, mental um, analysis, not analysis, but I'm not, I'm not using the right terminology here, forgive me, but like me, me, uh, uh, mental uh, testing, physical testing, they should have intensive therapy. 
everything that can um, cause them to be a, a contributing member of society. Um, and then they should have trades in there to find out once the junk is cleared away, what your passions are. I think if jail, if in the prison system, we had programs where people can find out what their passions are, they would be, there would be such high recidivism rates because when you lock somebody up and just lock them up and just throw away the key and they have nothing to do um how how are they supposed to become a better member of society um they should have programs in jail where where they can actually learn some stuff figure out what they're good at figure out what they they like to do um figure out what what they have an aptitude to do because everybody has a purpose and sometimes due to their background and whatever they don't have the tools or the money or the resources to find it and so when they c come back out they can be contributing members of society. And we should be welcoming people that have paid for their crimes and, and you know, just totally um, uh, welcoming them so that they can be contributing members of society. But instead of that, we lock them up and we throw away the key and we're like, you're no good to us anymore. Everybody deserves a chance. Everybody was created by God. Everybody's equal in the sight of God. The cross is level. The cross is for everybody. The love of Jesus is for everybody. I was singing this the other day. Um, I'm going to close the sermon. Um, and say that I was singing this the other day. Um, I was singing this old hymn. Um, I was singing. I was singing deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. We stand within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the wall there's lifted me now safe am I love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help, love lived in me. Oh, love lived in me. Love lived in me. To him I give ever 
to him I claim in his daily presence live ever his praise is safe love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best song faithful love brings service due to him belong oh love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me Look above, Jesus completely saves, and he will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea billows his will obey he or save your wants to be be saved to I, I was thinking as I was saying that I talked about society in general and how we like to put people on blast for for the their mistakes and we like to put celebrity on blast. But what I did say is the church that is supposed to be the most loving, the most forgiving place can be the worst for this. Like, we... We make people feel that you make one mistake, we don't love you anymore, God doesn't love you anymore, so we'll we'll just 
um, throw you away. But God doesn't say that. Um, Paul says, if you see somebody caught in a fall, restore that one. Because there's so many people that have been hurt and destroyed by words and policies in the church. I just have to wonder, what are we doing? What would Christ say? Because what we don't understand, we like like to make it all feel, feel pretty. But Jesus was kind of a gangster. He turned, he, when he was on this earth, before Jesus came, there were uh, three, um, like, classifications of Jews. There were the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. And these uh, classifications, these uh, uh, classifications of Jews all had different, all had different views on what the Messiah, Messiah would look like, and all had different things about what uh, people should be or whatever. And Jesus didn't fit into anything like that. He. He came to the earth as a baby in a stinky manger. Not a pretty ma- manger like we do at Christmas. The manger stunk to high heaven. Like, the, the, there, it was placed, it was a place where they kept animals. Like, they kept horses and all kinds of barn animals. So it was so stinky. So Jesus came, the Son of God came to that kind of atmosphere. Uh, And he hung around with people that other people didn't want to hang around with. He hung around with rich people he hung around with tax collectors. He hung around with uh, 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 hookers and exotic dancers, but he never judged them. He was he he was just so gentle with them. And I think we have this because the Bible isn't in our time. I think we have this skewed view that it was some kind of nicey nicey thing. Jesus was rough. Jesus did things that people didn't didn't like. He was he was loved by the sinners and hated by the by the uh so called religious people. And I think that we've just um gotten on our high horse for too long. We've cast away uh, people that God loves, and we've forgotten that everybody is somebody's somebody. Like, and when you and when you ca- cast that away in the name of Jesus or in the name of your false uh, correction, you are you are misrepresenting Jesus. You are hurting a person. Remember, that person is a person. They deserve love. They deserve respect. They deserve dignity, whether man, woman, LGBT, straight, whatever they are. Jesus loves them. And I'm not, and I'm not talking about excusing behavior, but there's a way to to address behavior and the person still come out feeling like they have some dignity, that they are respected, that they are loved. And yes, I think we, I know we need to still stick with the Bible, but we don't need to be crass. 
We don't need to be rude. And there is an in-between. And it takes wisdom, uh, God's wisdom, to deal with those kind of situations. But we've just kind of thrown away people that Jesus died for. How how dare we? And we need to uh, repent and realize that there's no shame in it. We just need, like I said, as the church, to be educated and learn from our mistakes. When we don't understand people, why don't we, instead of judging them and saying whatever, 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 why don't we sit down with them? Why don't we talk with them? Why don't we understand their story? Because when you understand a story, that is when a person becomes alive to you. Why don't you do some research? Why don't you take them out for lunch? Not not to save them, not to save them or even share Christ, but just for a meal together to 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 learn how to communicate with people that we're different from as humans. And if we can communicate with each other, despite our differences, we would think, we would know that we're all a part of God's family and that we all contribute something. We think we're so different, and we are. We have different personalities, different beliefs, different faith, but there, there are more about, there's more about us that is the same than what is different. And if you come and if you would come down off your high horse and see that, God would open up your eyes to a whole world of people that would just contribute to your life in in a very different way. Like I I don't know jelly roll. I don't know Morgan Wallen. I don't know uh, Ian Tongi, but but those people are different than me. Very, very different. Very different. They grew up differently, and they are very different from me. But I grew up. I I learned so much from those three gentlemen without even knowing them from just watching their videos. God has revealed to me so much about, you know, the prison system and, you know, uh, you know, it's just, and, you know, loving people where they are and being gracious to people. And it's just, such, it's just so amazing. And even um, in the case of Ian, the Lord has has opened up a whole Hawaiian culture, a whole reggae culture I never used to listen to re- reggae before. I don't like the hard reggae, but the the singing reggae and the whole smooth reggae, I call it. I'm starting to listen to that stuff and like it because God, I was able to to see another person who was different than me, who grew up in a different culture than me, and just totally got me into embracing a beautiful culture. See, I think when you come down to people that are different than you, you don't only learn from them, but you can, you can, um, they can add to you and you can add to them. I think that's what the world needs. The world needs to be able to come down to somebody who is different than them, different politically, different beliefs, different orientation. And, and instead of judging them, we can learn from them. And realize that we're all we're all humans. We all fall. 
we all need to learn and that is the the grace to grow and if we give people the grace to grow if we understand that life is a process god will open up a world that we wouldn't be able to to close and we'd be so much richer when your when your friends with someone different than you it opens up a richness it adds to your life that you um that you wouldn't be be um a- able to experience without that person i think that's what the world needs instead of judging and canceling and doing all these uh videos we need to come down and talk we need to communicate and talk about um not so much our differences but what's the same about us and we we need to let that person add to us instead of just judging them like why are they doing that Thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you you got something from this message. I certainly got something from preaching it. Thank you so much. Take care. God bless. Bye. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me oh love lifted me oh love lifted Thank you, guys. See you later. Bye.